Welcome and thank you for joining the webinar today. I'm Amanda Jadro, a Portfolio Manager with Tricom. As a financial solutions provider to staffing and consulting industry, it is our philosophy to be an active member in the staffing industry by staying abreast of the ever-changing marketplace. For that reason, Tricom was pleased to launch the Industry Insider webinar series designed to share our expert knowledge and resources with our fellow staffing industry colleagues. One of our core values is to build relationships and become a leading resource to the staffing and consulting firms nationwide. Our presenters today are Martin Barrasco, Timothy Suhaj, and Brian Curtis with Becker LLC. Becker has a unique commitment to the staffing industry. Through the Becker Staffing Institute and their leadership role in various staffing associations, Becker staffing attorneys keep abreast of the latest legal and business developments in the staffing industry. That dedication to understanding the staffing industry helps their attorneys retain up to date on the best legal and business practices in the industry, which delivers a tangible advantage to their staffing clients. Becker delivers their services through a cost effective and transparent project management based model. Through this model, they provide their clients with firm pricing and timetables for the delivery of work. Today, our presenters from Becker will be discussing better onboarding, creating a competitive advantage. The failure to adhere to best practices in onboarding and offboarding temporary employees leaves staffing companies at a competitive disadvantage and open to potential liability. Today's Industry Insider Webinar Series is designed to help staffing companies assess and overhaul certain aspects of their onboarding and offboarding processes to incorporate various best practices, limit potential liability, and improve efficiencies. We will also discuss at length several developments impacting best practices, including background checks, wage and hour trends, class action suits, and offboarding. By the end of the session, you'll know the best onboarding practices to create a competitive advantage for your staffing firm. If you have any questions during the presentation, please utilize the Q&A feature located on the right toolbar. After the presentation, there will be time for questions and an opportunity for you to give us your feedback on today's webinar by completing a short exit poll. Please join me in welcoming Martin, Timothy, and Brian. Thank you, Amanda. Good afternoon, everyone. This is uh, Martin Barrasco from the Becker Firm. And as Amanda said, our topic today is onboarding and offboarding. Um, our firm represents about 60 staffing firms across the nation. And one of the issues that we're often asked to help our clients with is helping them either with auditing and overhauling their entire onboarding and offboarding process or in helping them uh, review and implement best practices in certain discrete areas of their onboarding and offboarding pro process. Um, obviously, that, this is a, a very broad topic. Um, it varies uh, what your onboarding and offboarding process may look like by industry. Uh, for instance, a staffing firm that's engaged in light industrial or commercial staffing is probably going to have uh, a little bit of a different onboarding and offboarding process than an IT staffing firm. Um, what we're going to try and cover today is some of the hot button issues that we see on a regular basis and that impact um, most staffing firms regardless of their industry. Um, I have with me, as Amanda said, Tim Shuhai and Brian Curtis, uh, who often work with me on onboarding and offboarding matters with our clients. And the first topic we're going to talk about today is background checks. Uh, Brian, why don't I throw the first question to you? Um, what do you see as the most common mistake that you see clients or staffing firms make in the area of background checks? Um, well, what we typically see is, uh, you know, a misunderstanding of the individualized assessment process. Um, and what that means is the EOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, has set forth some guidance and detailed some requirements on which all employers are, uh, are required to follow um, when they're onboarding uh, new hires. Uh, and that is the individualized assessment. It seems to be that area that 
um, causes the most concern for staffing companies um, when they are looking to fill job orders. Well, so before we talk about what are some best practices to help staffing firms comply with uh, the requirements that uh, the EEOC um, imposes upon them, can you give uh, the audience maybe a current status of what the law is concerning individualized assessments? Sure. Um, the the first thing that I see oftentimes with this that the law focuses on and that a lot of employers um, don't really have a full grasp on is, is this idea that you need to tender a conditional offer of employment um, before you can conduct your background check, uh, whether you um, do it uh, internally or whether you outsource it to a third party. There are certain steps that you have to take first um, to do that. Uh, there are certain disclosures under the FCRA, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, um, which most people don't realize also covers background checks involving criminal um, convictions, arrest records, and things like that. Uh, there's a certain process you need to follow uh, to do that under the FCRA um, and under the EEOC guidelines. Uh, and there's actually specific language that they've detailed that should be in your disclosures. So when you're sitting there talking to um, a potential new hire or an applicant, uh, you want to make sure that you're getting their, you're giving them the disclosures, you're explaining it to them, and you're getting them to sign off on uh, those documents that you're going to need to protect yourself to show that you've gotten their consent to uh, conduct these background checks um, once you see that uh, they are for other purposes, at least conditionally meet the criteria that your client is looking for to fill the job. Okay. And in terms of, um, is there a context that you see uh, staffing agencies face a problem with individualized assessment? Is, is there a particular, you know, fact scenario that seems to cause uh, staffing agencies the most problem? Well, one of the things we often see are the green factors that go into this. I meant to touch on that before. Um, and that is those green factors, the way that the EOC looks at it, is, uh, you know, they look at the severity of the offense. Um, if, in fact, you conduct the background check and it comes back with negative information, such as a conviction, they look, as I said, they look at the severity of the offense. Um, they look at the time that's passed since the conviction or the sentence served so in case someone was incarcerated. Um, and then they look at the nature, you need to look at the nature of the job that's at issue. Um, and that, that's kind of how you uh, deal with the individualized assessment issue. Um, so that's kind of the balancing test that we always talk about. Those are the three factors that uh, the staffing agency has to balance in determining whether um, a criminal record should be um, disqualifying in the case of a particular job? Yes, and then, you know, one of the biggest problems that I see or that we've all seen um, here is you have, you know, the clients who essentially um, – really don't care about what the uh, background check is back as. If it comes back with negative information on it, um, and their concern is only that uh, they will not accept that candidate, um, and that becomes an issue for the staffing agency, who is the employer, who will ultimately be the employer of record for this applicant, um, because you still have to undergo the uh, this individualized assessment. You still have to consider these factors, um, and you oftentimes will run into pushback from a client who really doesn't care about what that assessment is. The, the sense from their perspective is that that's your issue to deal with as the employer of record. Just to make sure, because I think you're talking about the situation that I know I see all the time also, and that's the situation with where the staffing firm's client gives a blanket no. You're not talking about staffing firms themselves or or because we talk about our clients too. You're talking about when the staffing firm's client uh, or, or, or customer um, issues a blanket no and says, sorry, criminal record, we don't care what it is, we're not taking that. Person. Yes, absolutely. Thanks for clarifying that. That is exactly the issue. That's one of the biggest problems that in our experience that our staffing clients have been have had to address in this particular area with background checks is they have their own clients um, and customers who um, don't really um, have a concern about it because in their, from their perspective, it's the staffing agency's issue as the employer of record. 
So, so I, and I know I see that all the time, and I'm sure, Tim, you probably see that all the time, and, and I, I often get from clients, well, I don't want to lose the business. Right. Um, so, so what is the, the, the best practice, the advice that you give your clients uh, to help them hopefully not lose the business, but at the same time um, comply with the EEOC regulations? Sure. I mean, one of the things we always talk about with our clients is to be proactive. Um, you know, we're proactive with our own clients. We suggest to our own staffing clients that they need to proactive, be proactive with their clients. And in this regard, it's critical. Um, we consider it to be one of the best practices to make sure that they address these issues and these concerns with the client before they even start taking applications for the particular job. You know, clarify and get an understanding of what the job requirements are and clarify and get an understanding from your client um, that they recognize the fact that you have a responsibility under the EEOC guidelines um, when doing these background checks that, uh, that you have to go through this decision-making process to see whether or not, and this individualized assessment, to see whether or not these candidates who you've conditionally tendered an, um, an offer of employment to um, can actually still perform the job and still place, uh, fill the position. And if I might, Marty, I, I think this underscores an kind of an overarching issue that we'll keep touching on today that we see in all of our practices with staffing companies in adding value on the onboarding and offboarding process is being really preemptively uh, interactive with your clients. So getting some preemptive client involvement in this regard and other issues in onboarding and offboarding really do add value. And I think this is one or the first one that we're going to talk about today that really does add value in the process. So, yeah, yes, I, absolutely. Um, that definitely is one of the primary best practices I see in this area is, you know, addressing it with the client right from the get-go, right from the outset. And one other thing is, to, you know, um, it would be important for the staffing company to be tasked with creating what we have, we call a decision matrix. And essentially what that is, is you can very simply you can characterize it as a flow chart or some other type of document, which essentially lists out various types of criminal offenses or various types of offenses. Nothing has to be particular, but classes of offenses. Also lists out the type of job classifications where you're looking to fill these positions for your clients. And then um, a separate um, component to that is what would be a reasonable or rational relationship between those types of criminal convictions and the type of job classification you're looking to fill um, that would um, obviously mean that this individual would not be suitable for that position, the individual applicant. It makes it, when you have that on a bore on a flowchart in front of you, it does, it, make, it does make it much easier for you to really make that analysis. And it also makes it easier for you to get your client on board from the beginning. Um, uh, as we said before, um, it kind of relates to that first best practice of being proactive with the client. Let them see the decision matrix of how you feel this will apply and what you, you're subject to under the EEOC guidelines. Um, I know that's a, a really important tool that, that we help our clients with, so I want to talk about that a little bit more. Um, and, you know, when I always talk to clients about the decision matrix and, and see if you agree, I, I talk about, um, and, it, and it can take different formats, but I talk about kind of the, the green light. So if it falls in this sector of the decision matrix, if it's this type of crime, it's this type of time that's elapsed, um, and then it's green. And that means we should be able to hire this person. I call that the gray areas, and there's some areas that, you know, are difficult areas to really figure out when you're weighing the three factors where they come out, and that may be one, um, you know, that they have to think about if that situation arises. And then I, I have kind of the red light areas where um, if this set of circumstances comes about, then clearly we can outright reject the person. Can, can you go into just a tiny bit more detail about the type of things that uh, our staff, staffing firm should be considering and talking to about their client to, to kind of categorize into those three categories that I talked about. Yeah, I mean, like for a green light one, we'd see, and it kind of it relates back to what we talked about individualized assessment and looking at the nature of the event, uh, of the offense. Um, for instance, you, know, you have a 30 year old applicant who, when they were 18, year old, 18 years old, had a minor drug offense. Well, there's a sufficient amount of time that's gone by. The drug offense was minor. 
um, and yes, he was uh, an adult at the time, he or she was an adult at the time, but rather young and maybe a little bit more green as to certain things. And does that minor drug offense from 12 years ago really relate to the position you're looking to fill if he's now had a, you know, when you look at the other factors in this person's, in this individual's background um, and had a successful IT career and you're looking to place him in an IT position, that's a green light. I mean, that, that, it's common sense. It's very easy to think that way. Um, but then you've got some of the gray areas. Now, what happens if you're looking to um, place someone in a temporary accounting position? Um, and it turns out that five years ago they had a theft offense or shoplifting offense even. Well, that's an actual separate type of um, component. And that's not either, in, in our view and how we've applied it, that's not in a green light or a red light area, quite frankly. Um, now, if it had been a financial fraud, a financial crime, a financial fraud crime along those lines, then that's a red light area for someone in accounting looking to place an account, temp accounting position. But if it's something like a minor theft or, sh or shoplifting and, and you see the rest of the background, you have to look at the rest of the background of the individual and what's in their resume, what's in their job application, and what else you can develop. Um, and that, that does, it's a gray area, and therefore it's a call that, a business call that you have to make as the employer record on whether or not you want to hire this person. And in that regard, you need to have a close communication, again, why it's important to be open and direct with your client right up front of what you have to do, because you can come back to them and, and discuss with them what the issues and concerns you have about whether or not you can place this individual in the position. Tim, and I want to, I know that, um, you know, this is one of your strengths. It's that practical business advice. Um, because, you know, our clients are reluctant to take on their clients. So our staffing firms are, are reluctant to take on their clients. But, but in my experience, I don't know if it's the same with you, the being proactive up front really ends up fostering and furthering the relationship between our clients and their clients versus creating, you know, a rift. Can, can you go into a little bit of maybe some, a war story or some examples about how you've been brought into that and, and what the result has been? Well, I, I think it's piggyback on what Brian's talking about. If you can show a client before you take application one on the contract that you sign with your, your end user client, a matrix. And if it is somebody that's in the financial sector, we go through this gray area and say, this is what we're gonna see and what we have seen as an employer of record and finding candidates to place with you. If you're gonna come back and give me a blanket, I don't want anybody that has any type of criminal conviction in the background, well, that's, it will result in an X in my matrix, or Y in my, it's showing them the output that you're gonna get in your matrix, and it tees up the question with the client. And, and in my experience, in one example, a client that had a, we don't take anybody, had to kind of soften their view and realize that it's not as black and white as it is. Because by showing, like, I'm out here as the, the employer of record sourcing these people, and I have to put it in this matrix to comply with regulations, this, you know, it's the reality of the situation. This is what you're asking me to do, end user. And this right. is the data that's going to come out of it. And doing that before you start placing one candidate is a lot more constructive conversation. And I had one client do that, and it changed a little bit of the, the way that the employee of record staffing company dealt with their end user client in the fact that it was the reality and the practical solution to really a tough question because these gray areas come up. Um, I think before we move on to another topic, um, Brian, what are the typical consequences uh, for staffing firms that violate these EEOC regulations with respect to background checks and proper individual assessments? Well, the state state laws obviously vary, um, and in many states, the EEOC defaults to whatever state agency um, there is. So, you've got uh, oftentimes, even though it might be uh, under the EEOC restrictions, which is a federal law, um, as I said, if they default to a state agency to deal with it, they may combine whatever the state regulations are with what the Fed regulations are. So. Um, you know, not being able to give you detailed information as to each individual state, what I can tell you is that broadly on the federal level, um, we've seen ranges of, you know, $17,500 per affected employee. These are the types of fines and penalties that have been applied um, that the EEOC has been applying going after. 
Now, does that mean that that's what you're going to pay? Now, these are all these are negotiable. Um, these types of fines and penalties, but you know, uh, up until about two or three years ago, these fines and penalties were kind of smaller. Um, that's how they looked at it. And about three years, three and a half years ago, excuse me, um, the EOC upped their uh, regulatory fines for these types of penalties um, because they decided that they were going to be much more proactive in their enforcement. Um, and so now, you know, you're looking at penalties per affecting. When I say per affected employee, I'm using it interchangeable, by the way, with a new hire or an applicant or a candidate, because remember, we're going through this conditional offer process. So they may never be an employee, but for EEOC purposes, that deal really doesn't matter. And the fact that they're an applicant and that they were eventually, that offer of employment was um, withdrawn from them, and they decide to go to the EEOC about that issue, uh, you know, there's some... Uh, liability, potential liability for you as the employer of record, even though they were only an applicant and even though they were only a conditional employee. Um, let's move on to the next topic. And um, as we all know, many staffing agencies, in, in particular agencies, for instance, in light industrial and commercial staffing, um, controlling their workers' comp rating is right. such a key to their financial success because it can have such an impact on their bottom line and their margins. Um, so I guess my question to you, Brian, is obviously we could talk, we could have a whole webinar on on risk management right. practices that staffing firms can put in place to help with their um, workers' comp rating. But, but we're only focused on onboarding and offboarding here, so let's, let's keep that focus. And, and what would you say there are some best practices that staffing agencies can include in their onboarding and offboarding processes that can help them maintain uh, workers' comp ratings? Sure. Uh, well, let me just preface it with one of the primary reasons for this being part of an onboarding process um, and, and it being crucial to your onboarding uh, is, you know, it, it's audits. That's really what the issue is with workers' comp. Um, most of us have experience with loss, uh, loss experience ratings type of inquiries and audits uh, where the state may come in um, and, and re-evaluate uh, uh, based on your loss experience in the last year. But there are other types of audits as well, and oftentimes uh, a lot of our clients well, newer clients, a lot of our own newer clients who have come to us because they've had, um, they're subject to a workers' compensation audit based on co the comp, uh, I'm sorry, the code classifications. Uh, and in that instance, you, you know, the, depending on what state you're in, uh, some states do follow the NCCI. For those of you who are here in the, on the webinar and have some familiarity with the workers' comp, you know what NCCI is, the National Council on Compensation Insurance. Many states follow that. Um, but there are some states in the Midwest that are independent bureau states, some that are monopolistics. Uh, so there's a different approach depending on the type of state that you're operating in. Um, that's number one. Uh, then you've got these other types of audits that you have to be aware of. You've got an, you have a carrier audit. Your own carrier may decide internally that they're going to re-audit um, various of their clientele, which could various of their um, insurers, which could be you. Um, and in that case, you have no control over that, um, but they may, and what our experience has been, particularly over the last year or two, it's like a lot of carriers look at this as an additional revenue stream. Um, if they evaluate, they reevaluate the, uh, the workers' comp code classifications, and oftentimes, and I see this a lot in light industrial, um, oftentimes the, it's not the accurate code that's there, and they wind up being in a, higher risk classification and therefore a higher um, risk code, which is a more expensive code. Um, and that affects your bottom line um, because that's not the code classification you built into your contract. Um, and then finally, the last one, the last type of audit that's really important for you to be aware of are client, your own client audits. Now, when I call them audits, it might just be an inquiry where they're requesting your workers' comp documentation. And the fact of the matter is, over the last few months, we have seen a bit of an increase of that, and I do think that it's probably going to continue. And that's primarily because of, um, you know, these the changing definitions we're seeing across um, the federal uh, legal landscape on joint employer liability. 
it's got a it's got a lot of um, businesses that are a bit skittish, um, and we're hearing from our own uh, staffing clients that there are requests being made um, for their workers' comp data in order to ensure that people are properly coded. So you've got three areas of audits. It's not just your typical state audit, but you have to be concerned about your own carrier um, with an internal audit uh, against you, and you also have to be concerned about your own clients um, looking for data. So, so I understand that the, the trigger of the, the classification issue can be these audits. Right. So what can staffing firms do in their onboarding and offboarding practice to insulate them from you know, poor results in an audit. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I know that was a little bit of a long-winded preface to that, sorry about that, but I think it was important that uh, we all understand the various audits that can come into play here. But the best practices, you know, the first one that we've used and we've suggested um, to our clients is to ensure that we have a clear understanding of the client's needs from the outset. Ensure you, as a staffing agency, have a clear understanding of the client's needs from the outset. Get a job description from them for the job that wants to be filled. Regardless of whether you've filled it with them before, and you know, if, if you have an ongoing long-standing relationship with your clients, it's probably easier to get this information. You're probably more likely to know what those job descriptions are. But it's a, if you're not doing it and haven't done this, this is a good time to start. Um, get your job, job descriptions. Make sure that you have a clear understanding of what they are. Make sure they have a clear understanding of what they're supposed to be doing or what they want the position they want you to fill for them, um, and then take that job description, second best practice, take that job description, make sure you have, as, as, you, as well you should, have a clear and open line of communication with your carrier, with your carrier's agent, to your broker, um, and send them a copy of the job description. And if you've already got um, the relationship with the client, then you, and you know what codes these people are already in and you're just refilling or extending a job, um, a uh, job order, that's one thing. If it's a new uh, client and a new relationship um, with this new client and you want to make sure that the job description match, matches the workers' comp code, code classifications that you and your carrier are applying. And, and, and one practical tidbit here, also make sure that your contract allows you to share that outside of your relationship. Yeah, absolutely. Because so. oftentimes that's confidential information. You want to be able um, to make sure you can do that. Uh, and that leads to, you know, the third best. So I think those first two practices, um, one is understanding from the outset what the client's needs are, um, having clear communication with them, having clear communication with your own carrier, making sure the carrier has the job description and as closely as possible matches the code classifications that have been assigned. Um, and then the third one is, as best you can, implement a review process, an internal review process of this. Look, I know we're all strapped for time, um, and some of you may not be able to do a 30-day review on this, but we have found that, you know, if you can't do a 30-day review, try to do a quarterly review. But what we have found is that those clients, those of our clients, staffing clients who do that, um, are able to more easily spot and readily spot the hire, their hiring trends and what's happening. With them, and if you wind up having in a situation where you have a large number over the last quarter of placements in a particular code classification, that could really adversely affect your bottom line. All right. Um, so if you have that type of internal process to overview uh, what and, and be able to spot your hiring trends and who you've hired over the last 30, 60, and 90 days, that gives you a heads up, so to speak, on on what you may need to look at going forward when it comes time to renew your comp um, insurance, as well as when it comes time to renew your contracts. But, and, and if I may, one little follow-on point, I'm previewing and jumping ahead to another topic, but it also comes into play in offboarding. You can use the offboarding process to close the loop on some of this data acquisition that you're doing and proactive uh, activities with your end user client. As a staffing agency, you can also make sure in an exit interview, and we'll get to that, whether they actually did stay in the codes that they were initially uh, cast in in the job description. So it kind of closes the loop. But that's a practical point. We'll get to that in more detail later. Um, but the next topic, um, let's talk about wage and hour compliance. Um, to me, this has uh, been a headline uh, screaming throughout the industry over the last couple of years. 
Um, Tim, maybe you can explain why this has become such an important issue for the staffing industry. Well, I'll start with the from the 50,000 foot view and go inside the numbers, as they say. And they they are alarming if you're an employer. Um, the data from the United States federal court system of, with respect to the number of wage and hour claims is, is available in the public, but I'll, I'll give you from 2000 to 2015. In 2000, and this is only federal claims, this isn't related state claims or anything like that, these are just federal claims. Federal wage and hour claims in 2000, there were 1,935. In 2015, there were 8,781. So it's an exponential growth in the number of wage and hour claims at the federal level alone in that, uh, in that 15 year period. So that, the numbers tell you that it's growing, uh, I generally think there are two different categories and reasons behind it, one systemic and then the other the growth of the plaintiff population. Uh, the systemic issues that underlie this potential explosion in wage and hour claims is that the FLSA was really an old depression era law. It was, many would say it was uh, created for old industries, that it was uh, not completely defined or it was ill-defined in its inception that those definitions haven't really carried forward into a modern workplace or a modern economy, and many of the definitions in, the, in that law itself still remain ambiguous today. On top of the federal laws, you have state laws that have provided additional sources of litigation, uh, pay and other workplace practices that aren't covered in federal law are now being tagged on to, onto the FLSA, and they've been combined in the claim. So you're not just getting a federal claim, you're getting, you know, pendant state claims that add additional liabilities. Um, and employers have been, employees have become increasingly aware of their rights or their ability to seek recourse when they believe that their rights have been violated. Um, we can see that with a lot of the public headlines and so on. Um, and that also is because there's changes in the, in, in the exempt status, there's problems with working off the clock and, and calculation overtime payments, but the last systemic, um, causation, at least in my opinion, I think we've all seen it, is that the uh, plaintiff's bar has really taken this under their, uh, under their wing and they're looking at it as a way to generate revenue for themselves, and that may be also driving it. So that, I think, are the systemic factors, and I think touched a little bit on the growth of the employment pool or the potential plaintiff pool. Yeah, let, let's expand upon that because, I, I mean, we all understand that, that the plaintiff's bar plays a, a large role in that, and, and plaintiff's attorneys um, now look at wage and hour as a lucrative um, place for them to make money. But I, I think it's, it's more than just that. Uh, you talked about the change in the, in the status. I think there's some factors like that, that that have caused this kind of exponential growth in plaintiffs out there, not just plaintiff attorneys willing to represent them, but plaintiffs themselves. So maybe you can explain that a little bit more. There are several of those factors that are enlarging that pool of plaintiffs. One, and I'll start with the one you mentioned about uh, the proposal to revise, the Department of Labor's proposal to, to revise the white collar exemption regulations. And under the current proposals, the, the pool of people who will no longer be uh, exempt is will grow exponentially. And I think, Brian, you have some. Right, the, um, uh, currently the threshold is about 23.6, um, but the uh, proposed rule is looking to increase it to 50,400. Um, it's probably not, as usual, there should be some compromise at some point, but it's probably gonna run somewhere around 42 to 45. Um, but that essentially means that anyone making under that amount of money cannot be considered exempt. Um, they have to be paid on an hourly basis, um, and anything over 40 hours has to be paid a time and a half. And estimates are that if these come online, that the number of people that will fall into the non-exempt pool could be in the hundreds of thousands. So the, the number of potential plaintiffs just overnight will increase uh, rather uh, rather extremely, and just by that proposal alone. And one other, let me just jump in there, Tim, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. One other thing I wanted to add in there, too, is that with this proposal and this component of it that I'm about to tell you about is um, a key part of it, according to the Secretary of Labor, is that um, going forward, the threshold will automatically increase based on a factor of inflation, um, and there will be an automatic increase even in a non-inflation year, which essentially means that every year the pool of 
people who will be removed from the exempt status will grow because the threshold, the salary threshold is going to grow. Um, so we all need to be aware of it, um, that it's not something that's ever is going to be pulled back. It's going to keep going forward um, and keep expanding. So in light of an increased pull of potential claimants, some of the other factors that are driving those potential claimants would be, well, we talked about a little bit about classification of independent contract, but we, whether you're classified as an independent contractor versus an employee. And there's obviously, and I'll broad brush it, but a growing movement in the governmental regulatory agencies to make, make what we would call in the staffing industry independent contractors employees for different reasons and, and, and co-employment reasons. And that's increasing the role of the, uh, the size and of the pool of plaintiffs. We also have highly publicized lawsuits like Uber was another one where they were independent contractors. The drivers sued to say they were employees. There was no resolution. There was an out-of-court settlement. But many would see that even as the fact that Uber is paying the drivers that were complaining in that regard as some indication that there is traction and a way to get your employer to uh, honor some of these wage and hour issues that may not have been there before. So it's in the public media. The pool is growing. The theories that they can use are growing. And the particular, particularly troubling from the staffing industry side, as in its looming, is class action lawsuits. Well, let's talk about now that we've identified what the issue is or the cause of, of the rise in this issue. Um, let's talk about what some of the best practices that staffing firms can employ in onboarding and offboarding uh, temporary employees to protect against uh, wage and hour claims and, and liability. Tim, why don't you start? Well, one of the tools that we've, we've talked to our clients about, and it's one that's uh, in its nascent phase, is the use of class action waivers and using that in your onboarding process, and there are pros and cons to doing it. Uh, and, and the eff efficacy of using them is still in question. But it is something that we are looking at and have recommended to some clients, and some clients, our clients are using to try to extricate themselves from a, a large class action uh, proceeding by uh, employees in the, in, in the workplace. So it's one that you have to be careful Oh, in there, there are pros and cons to using them. Uh, we recommend whether using them or not, what your goals are as a staffing company, you know, what industry sector you're in, and you know, how you want to utilize it in your onboarding process. And those are pretty broad concepts. Um, if we want to talk about goals, uh, obviously the overriding goal is to protect the staffing company to protect itself from liability, and class action liability. Um, that's an easy one to get your head around. The con to it is, is, is it going to be something that you can enforce and how do you implement it without creating other problems for yourself? And we deal with that with clients all the time talking about, you know, is this something we understand the goal, that's easy, but implementing it can be uh, a lot of downsides. To but, well, but I want to talk about this in detail because I do think it's, it's one of the latest trends and it is potentially a very effective tool for staffing agencies to, to utilize to try to fend off some of this liability, but but um, just to make sure that that our audience understands it, um, it, there's really two aspects to this, right? So there's the class action waiver, mm -hmm. and that is the aspect where the temporary employees waive their right to be a part of the class action. Correct. And that's usually coupled with an arbitration provision, and that arbitration provision um, then forces um, any temporary employee to have to arbitrate any dispute they have, including wage and hour disputes. And, and they work together because if, uh, if you have um, just the arbitration provision, but you don't have a class action waiver, because we've certainly seen uh, folks who have uh, put into place an arbitration provision thinking that this solved the problem. Well, if you just have an arbitration provision and not a class action waiver, what people don't realize is you end up with a class action arbitration, um, which may be a little bit better because of, you know, maybe a little bit more freedom and a little bit more of a control on discovery, but in reality is not a great, great result. So, so I just want to make clear to, to everyone in the audience that we're really talking about two separate um, things that are married together to help insulate clients. But getting back to now kind of the, the pros and cons, um, 
you know, if, 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 I don't know if you were done with that or, or if you had other pros and cons you wanted to go through. Well, there's one other, and it, 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 and it dovetails with what you just said about arbitration. Even if you implement these properly and shield the, the staffing company from uh, the, the class action suit and avoid having a, a class action arbitration, depending on who and what client you're implementing this with and the number of potential plaintiffs, you could end up with a lot of one-off arbitrations as well. Because the way that the contract flows, it's like they're going to arbitrate it themselves. They can't do it as a class. But depending on the number of potential plaintiffs, you could have any number of those running simultaneously. So they're not as a class or as individual plaintiffs. So that's part of the cons. It's like you may do this, but one of the re results is you have 25 different claims running in arbitration. And individual expense. And the individual expense with each one of those. So that has to be weighed in the business judgment too, is, you know, is that that's a particular outcome that could happen. Have we seen it happen? I have not seen that happen. I don't know of anybody here that's seen that happen yet, but we do tell our clients that that's one of the potential outcomes of using this, this rubric to avoid, you know, the class action exposure. Let's talk about, um, you know, just when a client or a staffing firm decides that um, class action waiver along with an arbitration provision is in its best interest and, and um, it makes sense given its business goals to, to try and implement that. Uh, what is the, the, the best way of implementing that within the onboarding process? In our experience, we've, we recommend that it not be part of a handbook, that it be a separate agreement, conspicuous agreement, that has all the magic language, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But that we Why don't you want it part of the handbook? Because I, that's a question I always get from clients. They, they, have, they have handbooks. Um, they can be very effective. Uh, we are often working on part of, a, of the audit of an onboarding process on, on putting together an effective handbook, and they want to stick it in there, and that's what their gut tells them. But, but why is that not a good idea? Uh, because it's a cross-purposes with what the handbook is intended to do. The handbook, our, the handbooks that we do for clients always have a very prominent disclaimer that this handbook does not create an employment contract, that it's not a contractual relationship with the employee, so they remain an at-will employee, and we haven't formed an employment contract with them through the handbook. If you're adding a provision that must be a contractually agreed to provision to a handbook, you're, you may make your handbook into an employment agreement through the back door that you didn't mean to. So you're either putting something in that has to be enforceable into something that isn't a contract, so it's either making that a contract or it's making your uh, waiver unenforceable. So, so if, you, if you're not going to put it in as part of your, of your handbook, how should they be implementing a staffing firm? Uh, twofold. I mean, if it's in the rare occasion that you want to put it in employment, that you have an employment agreement with certain employees and you want to put it in, a, in their employment agreement, perfectly appropriate place to put it. But in the real instance where these are employees that aren't under contract, that are signing a handbook, we give our clients a one or two page addendum that is signed separately by, by the employee on the onboarding process that has the waiver and the arbitration clause right in its freestanding, standalone, separate piece of paper that's part of the onboarding process. Okay. Um, let's talk about, the, you know, is there magic language that has to be in uh, these one or two page documents that, that, that uh, our clients are giving to their temporary employees as part of the the onboarding process? Um, yes and no. Uh, the, this is a nascent area of the law and employment, and a lot of it, the law is, is pouring over from a consumer protection um, area of the law, so there hasn't been an exact fit with what exactly you have to do in the employment context that's universal across the, across the country. Uh, but there are trends, there are common themes that I'm not, as is with, um, consumer protection, the, the waiver has to be conspicuous. You can't hide it. That's why we say put it in a separate agreement so that it is there standing alone. It's conspicuous. You put it in the agreement. You have you, The language makes clear that you're waiving a right to go to court, that you're waiving your right to a jury trial. And that's important in New Jersey because in New Jersey there was a recent case where 
uh, waiver was found to be ineffective because it did not spell out that it was that you were waiving the right to go to trial or to have a jury trial on your claim. Uh, it must clearly waive that uh, right to trial and certain other statutory claims. It's got to be conspicuous. It's got to be clear. You should have in it that the you know the the saving language that they've read it and understood it. Um, you know they've had a chance to review it. Th those type of saving things that it's like you've you've seen it, you've read it, you've understood it, and have them sign it. Great. Well, our last topic is offboarding, and um, I don't know about the two of you, but um, to me, this is one of the more neglected parts of most of our clients' onboarding and offboarding process. I, I certainly understand from a business perspective because, you know, all of these operational compliance issues raise costs, take time away from employees. So I understand our clients' mindsets uh, a lot of time and why they ignore offboarding or, or maybe their offboarding process isn't as robust as their onboarding process. But, but let's talk about um, why we why we counsel our clients to care more about their offboarding process. Tim, do you want to start off? Yeah, and I think, again, we start with the, there's a systemic reason for doing it. You have certain statutory and regulatory obligations as a staffing agency when you're offboarding an employee, whether that's a temporary employee or one of your own permanent employee staff, that you, you have to comply with. I mean, you can't ignore them. You have to do them. That's the unsexy part. I have a good war story there. We, we have a client who was moving into different states, um, they were more of an East Coast base initially in terms of where they placed folks, and they started moving west, and, the, and they placed folks in California. And they didn't realize that in California that you have to pay um, temporary employees um, within 24 hours of their last day of work, and they just kept remitting their last payment as part of the ordinary biweekly payment check process, and um, so they didn't look into whether what the offboarding regulations were in the new states they were, and they ended up in a, in a major class action um, because of that. So um, I think that's a very important point that uh, folks need to realize. And, and, and in addition to that, I, it, there's a couple other reasons that offboarding adds value. Um, one, it's an, an ability to, to accumulate data, which we talked about a little bit earlier to kind of close the loop on some of the other audits and, uh, and other liability trails that you're trying to track, here's your chance in an offboarding process to, to get data in an exit interview or from your, your outbound clients to make sure that everything is fitting the way it should have been on the onboarding side, number one, and two, the social impact. I mean, a lot, with social media now, with you, you want to keep a good relationship, or I'll put it another way, why wouldn't you want to keep a good relationship? with outgoing employees because one, you may want to keep them as a live potential recruit to bring back, so you want this to be a good process for them so that you don't lose them as a, a reoccurring employee. And two, you don't want them out there uh, you know, bad-mouthing you as a, and hurting your ability to recruit other people because they are going out into the back into the recruiting pool, so to speak, and you don't want them kind of uh, poisoning that uh, well for you. It, it, just for the mere fact that you didn't really control the offboarding process. So there's some value, uh, and some people place a lot of value on that depending on what kind of uh, people they're recruiting um, in the offboarding process that can be gained. So, so. Yeah, but, uh, and I was just going to add, just um, particularly with your internal um, staff, uh, crucial, I think, to offboard them properly and get the data you need um, particularly because, you know, your recruiters are your sales team. And, you know, if they're, if you've got non-competes and non-solicits and confidential um, and proprietary information provisions in place um, with these individuals, you don't want them walking out the door with your client list, uh, you know, in, or their contacts. Uh, and if they are walking out the door with it, you're going to have a way to find that out. Um, and you don't want them going to a competitor. Um, so obviously offboarding this, um, even whether it's a voluntary departure, learning this information, understanding what it is that prompted them to move elsewhere, gives you information you can use, and also gives you the information you may need three, six, 12 months down the road if you find out that they're at a competitor um, and you need to do something to enforce your non-competes or that they're using your confidential information. 
in some way. Um, and so it's it's obviously important for that aspect as well. And one other thing too, I mean, you know, there oftentimes and it kind of touches on what um, Tim was saying about you know you want to keep a good relationship because of the prevalence of social media um, and what they can say about you. But the flip side of that is you have to be concerned about what they believe you're saying about them um, uh, because as most employers don't realize that there are post-employment liability issues they have. Many states and under Title VII, a federal statute, civil rights statute, um, that relates to employment issues, uh, many um, individuals can pursue uh, claims as a former employee. Um, usually it arises in areas where uh, you know, your employee leaves and three or four months later they haven't been able to find a job, particularly if this is in a termination scenario rather than a voluntary departure, and they haven't been able to find a job and they have somebody call um, your facility for their references. Um, and that person is learning negative information from them. Uh, you know, they can then pursue a claim against you. You don't want that. So obviously you want to have an offboarding process in place that funnels this information to a single point of contact or a team within your organization who can handle these types of post-employment or potential post-employment liability issues. Anyone calls for a reference about a former employee only one person gives the information out. And every single person in your organization has to know that that cut type of call gets funneled to that one single point of contact. And that's the best way, and under EEOC regulations um, and, and under Title VII, there's a case out there under Title VII that deals with this issue, um, if you can show that you have this single point of contact and a system in place for your offboarding, it's a valid defense, a pretty strong defense, not, not not an absolute one, but a pretty strong defense to show that um, you know you're not liable for these potential post-employment issues. And, and one real practical point on that too is if you can control this on the, uh, with the outgoing employee as they go out the door. A lot of times, the only people they know are the recruiters. Mm -hmm. So when they're asked by their next employer, "Who do I call?" they give them a recruiter's number, and now they're calling a recruiter and not the HR or single point of contact that should be called. And, and that that tends to be something you can control in the process. We're running out of time, but, but let's try and, and checklist some of the um, best practices in terms of offboarding procedures that, that we recommend for staffing firms. One of the things, and I'll take it all the way back to the value proposition and, and not overburdening your staff, is many of these things can be automated. That creating these checklists, they're fairly mechanical. Uh, that run the length of, you know, have you hit all your regulatory and statutory requirements? Have you collected all the data and personal, the personal uh, property that belongs to the company, phones, computers, whatever? Have you gotten any information depending on the industry that you're, you've placed the people in? Is there IP that needs to be uh, returned, disclosed? Uh, as Brian said, you remind most everybody that they are subject to restrictive covenants, so it's just non-competes. And confidential information and non-solicitation uh, uh, provisions and covenants. Um, the other thing that is really important is to do quality control. If I if I had to say the one practical thing, it's great to have checklists. We can you know they are mechanical, but they're only as good as how they're implemented and how they're quality controlled. Did the checklist get done? Did all the pieces get put into it? It can be automated. And to Brian's point, you should go back and audit because what you may be responsible for doing to your story as well is like, okay, now you're in California and there's a different requirement. So if you're going into a new state or you're going into a new industry, are there different requirements that are going to be reflected in your offboarding process or should be reflected in your offboarding process? So. Once you have a checklist, it's implementing it with the employee, implementing it internally to make sure that all the information and data that you need comes back, that you have it in a way that you can use it, that you can prove that you got it back, that the client had a good, or the, the employee had a, a quote, good experience in the offboarding, uh, that you don't poison that well, and that you can do it in a way that's pretty effective from a cost point of view if you can automate it. I think it's important that I think you mentioned it. Tim, uh, or at least alluded to it, it's important for folks to know that depending on your industry, for instance, if you're an IT staffing firm 
your offboarding checklist is going to be different in some areas than if you're in light industrial or if you're a healthcare staffing firm because sure. mm -hmm. in IT you're going to, you may have intellectual property concerns. In healthcare you may have HIPAA and other concerns. So it's important for folks to understand that this needs to be tailored to what their, their business is. Uh, last question, um, and then we can open this up to questions from the audience. Um, Brian, I know this is an, an area that you handle with a lot of folks, but should your offboarding process be different for somebody who's been terminated or fired than for somebody whose you know, time of employment or their temporary position has just lapsed? Should that be a different process if they've been terminated or fired? Yeah, absolutely it should be. You, um, that's a less automated process. You need to have um, someone on your team um, sitting with them uh, and going through this process with them individually and trying to ensure uh, that the person clearly understands the purpose of the termination, whether it was for numbers or lack of profitability, whatever it might be, uh, because you want to minimize uh, what their thoughts are um, and, and what their feelings are when they go out the door and how they're going to react to it two or three or five days afterwards after they're gone. You need to have a human touch um, in a termination um, scenario, particularly if it's a performance issue. Um, it has to be less automated for that. It gives you greater protections um, because that's the kind of former employee who, has, who may have the the more negative feelings resulting from from their departure and maybe the ones that look to see if there was some other reason for it. Um, and so it's important to make sure you have uh, somebody in the room with them um, who's familiar with uh, the process, who has some, you know, good table side manner, so to speak, um, and be able to, to walk that person through it. Okay. Um, if there's any questions, we'd be happy to take some uh, questions now. Okay, so uh, the floor is open for questions. Please go ahead and submit them using either the Q&A feature or the chat feature located on the right toolbar. I will also open up a poll that you can um, give us your feedback on today's webinar. And as um, questions are coming in, um, do you have any just overall um, thoughts or um, ideas of what they should implement most immediately in an onboarding or offboarding practice as um, clients are taking this all in? Uh, I, I think usually we recommend that it starts with an audit of the onboarding and the offboarding practice. Um, that's something that we are asked to do for clients on a regular basis. Um, it's um, you know, not that cumbersome of a process. I mean, there is some detail and time involved, but it's not as cumbersome as clients may think. And uh, usually in the audit process, um, we can identify whether or not the client's using best practices and, and where perhaps they can improve their processes. Wonderful. And, and, and this is Tim. Almost always the thing that's, that it needs support is quality control. Most most staffing companies have obviously an onboarding process and an offboarding process. Those can be made more robust along the lines of what we're talking about here today. But what usually is lacking is the quality control component. Uh, that where it, the the process itself is is vetted occasionally to make sure that it's functioning the way it should and doing what it should be doing. And and once you get a good just one more thing on that. Once you get a good process in place then it's just a matter of updating it from time to time because, um, and, and Brian can talk about what he recommends with respect to, for instance, handbooks, uh, and, and we've done handbooks for, for you know, every state in, in, in the country for our staffing agencies, but talk about how often you should be, for instance, updating a handbook just because of changes in, in regulation that are occurring at such a fast pace these days. Yeah, our typical recommendation would be to have either, depending on the size of the uh, size of the organization, to either have an annual or biannual, meaning every two years, um, have your handbook updated uh, in order to take advantage of uh, the most current regulations and, and those updates. Um, 
but uh, again, if it's a smaller outfit, uh, we usually will recommend every two years having it updated. Uh, you know, we often will keep our own clients in the loop with updates on a fairly regular basis um, so that they're aware of it and then they can send a me supplemental memo um, in the interim. Uh, so, you know, but most, for the most part, it's a two-year, unless you're a larger organization of, uh, you know, 500 or more employees, and we typically re recommend um, an annual one because there's just such an um, accelerated pace of change with, uh, with the regulations and the laws. And do you have a recommendation on uh, where they should or could potentially get advice on updating a handbook? Well, certainly, the, the, you know, their lawyers can provide it. Um, you know, I mean, we've written and put together so many staffing industry handbooks, so um, a, a competent staff and industry lawyer can should be able to provide them with the advice and should have the experience having, you know, put together a number of them to be able to do it efficiently. Um, and just as a suggestion, I know a lot of people would um, think of this as, yeah, I'm sure I hear this all the time with people I talk with where they say, well, you know, I can just run on Google and get something from SHRM, the Society for Human Resource Management, uh, or something along those lines, get a template from them. But that's just what it is. It's a template. Um, and it's not unique to, number one, the staffing industry, and certainly wouldn't be unique to your own individual circumstances in your company. Um, depending on your industry, you would have different requirements. Uh, for some, for certain industries, you might have, um, they're more relevant to have OSHA uh, requirements and ergonomics information in your, in your handbook in order to satisfy OSHA requirements than, than other industries would have, um, particularly if you're in light industrial as opposed to IT, all right? Um, so there's different, it, it needs to be not just company specific to you, but it's industry specific, it's state specific. Um, so try not to use a template. Um, you know, try to find an expert who can give you the right guidance and putting it together um, for your situation. By the way, we've represented some, uh, um, you know, as Marty had introduced us, he had indicated we represent 60 some, uh, staffing agencies across the nation, what we have often done is we create an internal handbook, and the temp handbook also has to be a little bit different uh, because of joint employer liability issues and because of differences in what protections um, and what disclosures have to be made um, based, again, on the industry, all right? So sometimes you might even find yourself needing two different handbooks, one for your internals and one for your, uh, your temp staff. Wonderful. Well, I don't have any other questions. Uh, I really uh, appreciate your time today and all of the knowledge that you have shared uh, with all of our attendees this afternoon. I'd like to thank, your, um, thank you for your time and thank our audience for their time today in attending this session. We will have a recording of the webinar available on our website at tricom.com under the resources and industry insider webinars tab. Thank you again for your time and watch for information on our next webinar session. Have a fantastic day. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.